Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is David Correa. I'm a professor of a course this semester. For those of you that don't know, many of you do, because you're my students. Uh, called Police Violence and Social Control, and this is uh, uh, part three in an eight-part public lecture series. Um, I, uh, I'll be turning this over to Eddie Molina, who's a student in the class, and who'll be moderating the discussion today, but I wanted to make a few announcements before that. Um, first, what we, we'll have uh, Ken Ellis, who's the father of Ken Ellis III, who was shot and killed by APD on January 13th, 2010. Uh, and he'll be joined by Steve Torres, uh, whose son Christopher Torres was killed by APD in 2011, and who was profiled in the recent New Yorker article that my students have read and maybe others have read as well. Steve is an attorney in town, and he was unavoidably called into court. Uh, he emailed me about a half an hour ago, said he's going to rush over here and he's going to be a bit late. So um, I want to start anyways, and we'll start our conversation with Ken, and when Steve when Steve enters the conversation, we can uh, continue with him. So, um, Steve's wife, Renetta, was unable to make it today, so it's just going to be uh, Mike and Steve, and I'm happy that they agreed to come to talk to us. Um, I do want to say before I turn it over to Eddie that um, if, you, if you haven't already gotten a copy, I have a few copies of the flyer announcing the rest of the lectures for this semester. Um, for the next uh, five Thursdays after today, we'll have lectures every Thursday at UNM. Um, the next one is next Thursday um, in Sub Lobo A and B with New Mexico State Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino talking about police violence and disability. Um, and uh, there'll be four more after that. And again, if you want a, a flyer, please uh, let me know uh, afterwards and I can get you a flyer so you're aware of the, of the schedule. Um, I, I want to, before I introduce Eddie, I wanted to say a few things about uh, today's lecture. This is an important one for me personally. Um, you know, one of the first two, actually, some of the first uh, folks I, I, I really got to know, um, Ken Ellis was one of them, Steve Torres, Mike Gomez. Um, and I've always been personally um, inspired and, and, and awed um, by the tenacity and the, um, and the willingness of people like Ken Ellis and Steve Torres and Renetta Torres and Mike, Mike Gomez, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, to really confront the injustice that's happened to their, their ch children and to not give up. It's, a, it's an incredibly painful thing. And I'm, uh, you know, I admire Ken very much. And um, I really... Likewise. Thank you. And, um, you know, my students in this class know because they've read about uh, the situation with Christopher Torres and some with, with Ken Ellis' son. But, you know, um, you know these are, these are um, I think, really important um, events to remember as part of a larger pattern. And, and I think Ken can speak to not only the, the uh, profound injustice that, that his family has experienced, the loss of his, his son, Ken Ellis III, but, but the way that, that that pattern has continued in other other parents are suffering that same thing too. Um, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm very um, happy to have Ken here. And um, if you've been to any of the other lectures that we've had, you know that students in the class moderate that. And today, Eddie Molina will be moderating the, the uh, discussion. Eddie is a junior at UNM, majoring in biochemistry. Yes. Majoring in biochemistry. Um, and so we have some, um, some questions that Eddie will be asking, and then we're going to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So, so hold your questions to the end, and then everyone hopefully will have a chance to, to ask any questions they'd like. Um, so uh, again, uh, Steve Torres will be here a little bit late, um, and he'll just step right into the conversation. Um, and so for now, I want to thank uh, Ken Ellis for coming today. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, David. Um, first of all, um, Ken, thank you. Our class really appreciates you taking the time. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. To come out and share you know, your story. And, and it's just something that our class is really passionate about. And Excellent. We need that. It's really you know, a tough situation for a lot of families out there. Absolutely. But let's get into our first question. Um, Ken, you told the New Yorker reporter that shortly after meeting Steve Gomez, he told you that you're all members of a family nobody wants to be a part of. That's particularly poignant in your case, Ken. When we talk about police violence in Albuquerque, we often refer to the 28 people killed since 2010. Your son was the first of these 28 people. By understanding yourself 
as part of this family. What does that mean to you? Do you grieve anew each time another person is killed? And does this explain the tenacity you've displayed in demanding accountability for your, your son's deaths? Well, let me uh, address the first part of that. Um, uh, Stephen Torres, uh, Stephen Torres is going to be here in a little bit, and he's the one that coined that phrase that we're all part of a family that, that no one wants to be a part of, and that's uh, couldn't be uh, truer, truer words that have never been spoken. So, um, yeah, it... Uh, <clears throat> The tenacity. Um, every time, well, let me answer the questions. That wanted. So, you know, every time someone gets shot, every time I see, you know, I have this social media and this iPhone, and I and I am connected with people all over the country, and 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 this this police brutality and this militarized police departments across this country, or you know, I I get uh, you know stuff through the social media every day where they're killing somebody in this country every day. They're averaging three people a day. They're killing three people a day in this country. Um, our police department has killed more people than, than the terrorists have killed. So that's a pretty profound uh, uh, fact. Um, <clears throat> my tenacity, um, well, uh, my tenacity comes from, uh, you know, I, I had to make a choice and, 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 uh, and I had to do something. You know, I couldn't just... Uh, couldn't just lay down and let it let it go. I had to I had to address the issue. I had to find out what was going on. And uh, so, you know, I have uh, I moved here from Arizona after they killed my son, and I actually have uh, five grandsons that live in this city right now. And uh, so, I guess my tenacity comes from the love of them young boys and not wanting them to be victimized like their uncle was. So, uh, you know, my my drive and my motivation is to get. Uh, you know, uh, an accountable police department within. You know. So that's uh, pretty much uh, where I'm at with that. We absolutely have to have uh, each and every one of us has to play a part in this, or it's never going to do any difference. We all got to stand up for our, for our rights and our constitutional rights. And um, you know, if we don't stand up, then then our children are going to be uh, having to do what we should have done. So I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. Um, and the second question, um, this is kind of for all of you guys, but uh, Steve isn't here yet, but in, in your demands for accountability at APD, you've all three at one time or another made clear that you're looking for justice in your son's unjustified deaths. Is justice possible in these cases? And if so, what would real justice for these unjustified deaths of your sons look like? Well, um, so let's see, where which question was that? I, got, I want to start from the top here. My demands for accountability. Um, what would justice look like? Justice would look like uh, an indictment, um, having the individual that violated my son's rights brought before a, a, a jury. And uh, you know, and, and let you know, you know, let justice take its due course. Um, you know, the fact is, is that under the current system, there's not going to be. Well, you know, let me back up a little bit because we do have a, uh, you know, District Attorney Kerry Brandenburg has finally indicted a couple officers for the first time in history, and that was the two officers that killed the homeless camper. So I see the dynamic shifting, and I see where you know, and I, I can see a light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, but it's going to be a long road to hoe. We have uh, we have a lot a lot uh, of policies and, and you know we got <clears throat> these officers have been trained paramilitary over the last uh, well since 9/11 basically and uh, you know we have to retrain our officers each and every one of them. They've all been trained in a paramilitary style. Um, they're not trained to protect and serve anymore. They're trained trained to enforce the law and they, they spend a lot of time on the firing range um, and that's not the type of officers that we need. We have a military, we don't need a police as a military. Um, so um, I guess uh, is justice possible in these cases? Yes it is um, and uh, what would real justice look like on just something like well. <clears throat> 
like I say, justice would be uh, having true accountability of law enforcement. They are not above the law as much as facts have proved different. They are still or should be held accountable to, a high, to the laws and to a higher standard, but uh, that's not happening. And that's, that's you know, I'm, I'm a veteran. My son was a veteran, and uh, you know, it's very disturbing to me to have and to witness people's constitutional rights being violated on a daily basis. I mean, we have you know Arlington National Monument full of veterans that have fought for that constitution and died for that constitution, and we have a police force that's ignoring it. Every veteran in this country should be appalled at what's going on with our police departments. And uh, so, but uh, yeah, we uh, definitely got to have accountability, and that would be uh, indictments. So, you know, uh, Stefan Torres is going to be here in a little while. He shot his bat son in the back three times at point blank range. I mean, how do you justify shooting someone in the back? Mike Gomez's son was shot in the back. You know, uh, Earl Mitchell's grandson was shot in the back. I mean, these guys are getting away with murder, literally getting away with murdering people all across this country and violating people's rights. I mean, I choked an old boy to death in, 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 in New York. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It just never stops. And I, it's just, at some point or another, uh, this, it needs to come to a, needs to come to a halt and we need to do an about face on this and it's going to take each and every one in this room and each and every one in this that uh, is a part of this uh, great nation to to stand up and, and and voice their concerns with their with the law enforcement it's hard to wrap your mind around the extent of the of the regime you know that's what it is it's a regime it, it, it doesn't follow the it APD is a regime they, they don't follow the laws they're sworn to uphold they uh, literally are above the laws. And I know each and every one of you has seen cops flying through town, illegal lane changes, you know, California stops at times. These guys, it's the simplest laws that they break that culminate into the, into the most absurd laws that they break. So it's, uh, you know, it's just a matter of accountability and holding our, holding our um, executive branch uh, accountable to the judicial branch. So we need to each and every one of us got to do our part to make this right, or else uh, if we don't, then uh, you know our kids and grandkids will suffer for our lack of uh, involvement. Um, Ken, I just want to echo the sentiment that um, that we as a community, you know, we entrust great responsibility onto our police force, to first to serve, and second to protect the community, and that same coin I feel requires equal accountability. When you have so much responsibility, when you, you do something wrong, you have to, you know, be accountable for what you've done because of the responsibility that, you know, we entrust our officers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, accountability. <laughs> There's absolutely no accountability in this police department and in, uh, in law enforcement in general. They are literally allowed to get away with breaking the laws that they're sworn to uphold. You know, in reality, is they should be held to a higher standard. They should be, uh, you know, more ethical and moral than than the average person. And the uh, reality is, is that they're, you know, they're uh, they're not. They're they're being trained to kill, and that's what they're doing. So here we are. Um, I would recommend and suggest to anyone that has a crisis at home, don't call the police. Call your neighbor. Call your friend. Call a family member. Call anybody but the police. You call the police and you're putting your life and everybody's in, in that area's life's in danger because these cops only know how to act one way. They automatically go for their weapon. You watch them. They walk around with their hand on their guns. That's their, that's their, that's their bravado. That's what gives them their, um, you know, that's what gives them their strength. There ain't nothing without that gun. So another question. Um, we, we'd all like to know from our class, uh, are you guys, as a group, uh, satisfied with the consent decree between the city and the Department of Justice? No. Um, if no, where do you think it fails to produce real accountability? Well, um, you know, they're leaving it all up to one individual. They're leaving it all up to the chief of police, and it shouldn't be up to one individual. To, to, it should be up to a committee, a board, uh, you know, a, a consensus on what on what kind of discipline should be handed down. We have a police oversight board or commission or whatever they want to call it nowadays, and it's, 
it's a farce. I mean, it doesn't have any kind of, all it can do is recommend what, you know, and that's not going to work. When you put all that power in one individual and, and, you know, keep in mind that they're all wearing blue, they all bleed blue, they're all brothers. So, you know, you can't have police policing police. It doesn't work. Um, we have uh, um, a big problem with accountability and a big problem with, uh, and, and that accountability goes all the way up to the chief of police. I mean, it starts from the top. Could you tell us more about, um, in specifics, like the case of your son and the lack of accountability there? Like, how did they try to solve the problem and, and where in their solutions, what was lacking? Well, um, in my son's case, you know, the truth is, and the fact is, and it has never came out yet, is that the officer that shot my son was a, was a negative discharge. The officer did not mean to kill my son, but the police department wouldn't let him. Wouldn't let the officer be forthright with what happened. They they automatically went there, and their internal affairs unit um, went there and orchestrated a cover up and, and started started the process to, uh, you know, um, you know, to uh, make my son look like a criminal and a bad guy and a car thief and this and that. I mean. Uh, the, the defamation of character was just uh, appalling to me that they would do that to a, a Purple Heart recipient of the, of the, you know, of the war. You know, my boy went to war to fight for this country and fight for our rights, and uh, so, you know, they, they, they started lying right off the bat, and uh, and so, you know, they said suicide by cop came out in the paper the next day, and that couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, so, you know. We really have to have, uh, you know, the truth be told about these cases. So, and, and the bottom line is, is that that doesn't happen. They, um, the only way we can get the truth out is through social media. So, this is Mr. Mr. Torres, Stefan Torres, and this is. Uh, Thank you, Eddie. Okay. He's the father of uh, Christopher Torres, who was shot in the back three times. So he's going to join the conversation. Thank Good you. to see you, Stephen. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Um, Apologize for running late. I just got out of court. I got out as quick as I could. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting. Um, Stephen, uh, Wahaka, uh, would you like, like to introduce yourself a little bit to the? Uh, David gave a quick introduction, but um, certainly update the crowd. My, my name is Steve Torres. I'm an attorney here in town. I've been practicing law here for goodness 35 years. Next month. Um, of course, the reason I'm here today is uh, my son, my youngest son, Christopher, was shot and killed by two APD uh, police detectives uh, four years ago next month. It'll be four years in three weeks or so. Uh, Christopher was home in our backyard where, where we thought he was safe and he was relaxing. He had just gotten home from work. And he was relaxing when he was approached and confronted by two police officers dressed in plain clothes. Um, we're still not sure if they properly identified themselves, if he knew who they were, if he knew why they were there. What we do know is that a confrontation ensued um, based on the testimony of the one eyewitness to what happened, uh, the one independent eyewitness to what happened. It appears that Christopher was trying to withdraw from the situation and um, the, the one officer rushed him, tackled him, threw him to the ground. The other officer came and they both straddled him. They began to pummel him, uh, punch him um, repeatedly around the face. Somehow during this scuffle, his ribs were broken. Um, the officers claimed that Christopher somehow managed to get one of their guns and therefore they were supposedly in fear for their life. Again, the, eye, the eyewitness um, discredited that testimony and when we went to court, Judge Shannon Bacon found that the officer's version of what had supposedly happened was simply not credible and did not comport with the evidence. I mean, for example, the officer said that there was a struggle for his gun, 
and right there in the gravel and the rocks, they were, they were trying to get control of the gun, but somehow this gun never got a scratch on it. So it, it, again, the, the testimony just did not support the officer's versions of the story. Um, they ended up shooting my son three times in the back at point blank range. While he's laying on the ground face down. Four years later, it's still tough. Yep. Um, the first two shots almost certainly incapacitated him. It's highly unlikely he was resisting anymore after that, but they still felt it necessary to shoot one more fatal shot into him. And for the last four years, we've been struggling for justice. And so with the help of a lot of people, a lot of people I recognize in the room here today, a lot of people who have come to our assistance and our aid, we, we've been we've been able to, th to do what I thought was almost impossible four years ago. If you would have asked me four years ago what our chances were of bringing the Department of Justice into Albuquerque, I would have told you, no way. They're not gonna, they're not gonna take an interest in what's going on in Albuquerque. But again, with the help of a lot of people here in Albuquerque, across the strait, across the country, even people from around the world, this social, this social, this social media is amazing. You can get a hold of people all over the world, and we had, we had people from Great Britain, from Japan, who were submitting online petitions asking the Department of Justice to come to Albuquerque and take a look at what was going on. They did come, and as you know, um, they issued some scathing findings about what they found out in our police department, and um, so we're trying. As Ken and I and Mike have said, Mike Gomez, as we have said numerous times, we are members of a club that doesn't want any new members. And we've been trying for the last four years to make sure that what happened to our sons doesn't happen to anybody else. And that's who I am, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Steven, thank you for coming. You're welcome. Today. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I know you 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 guys are awfully busy, and <laughs> you guys take the time to come out and um, keep the conversation alive in the community. It's very important for people to hear your guys' stories because that's what makes the most impact in like everybody's. That's how they remember what's going on in our community. So the first question for you, um, the district attorney refused to prosecute the officers who killed Christopher, calling the shooting justified. You sued in state and federal court. Could you give us an update on the status of the civil lawsuits um, against the city and APD? Certainly, let me, let, me con let me comment first on District Attorney Brandenburg's decision not to prosecute. Um, in fact, I was just reviewing the news article on it the other day to, because I anticipated that question. She said that two years after the fact, they finally, the, the police department, the, the investigators, two years after the fact, finally got around to interviewing the independent eyewitness. Why it took them two years to do that, we don't know. But, um, but, so, but after they interviewed the eyewitness, by the way, she was a neighbor who, who lives in the house right behind our house, and she just happened to be in her backyard that afternoon when this whole thing happened. And anyway, um, District Attorney Brandenburg said that after she had reviewed the information that had come to her from the investigating officers, that she found the testimony of the eyewitness to be inconsistent, that there were too many inconsistencies, and she felt, felt that because of that, she did not have enough evidence upon which to justify proceeding with criminal charges against the police. Well, it's interesting to note that when we finally got to court, Judge Bacon decided that the testimony of the independent eyewitness was the most credible evidence around. 
So why, why, why Kerry Brandenburg decided not to prosecute again is, is a mystery, although it was certainly a decision that we had anticipated. Um, this DA had never, during the whole entire time that she'd been in office, had never prosecuted a single police officer for excessive force or battery until the James Wade incident. And of course, at that point, she, in our opinion, she didn't have much choice. The, the evidence was just overwhelming. But, um, but for whatever reason, it, it did take her close to three years before she decided not to prosecute the officers in Christopher's case. But then she ultimately decided that no, they were, she was not going to prosecute them although she did have some criticism of the, of the work that the police department had done and why it had taken them so long to interview the, the eyewitness. As far as our lawsuit, um, as I think most of you know, uh, our attorneys decided to, that, uh, that our strategy would be to file in both state district court and federal court. That was a strategic move that we did that, uh, that I don't believe you guys did. Uh, and again, there were pros and cons for doing it. Um, our lawsuit in state court has been concluded. Judge Bacon found in our favor. Uh, as I said, she, she ruled that the testimony of the officers was simply not credible and did not comport with the, with the evidence. And so she ruled in our favor, awarded us a considerable amount of damages. And of course, we have yet to see a penny of it, but, th but that's just because that's the way things go. Uh, that case has subsequently been appealed both sides appealed. We appealed and the other side appealed. We appealed uh, because we, we think that the, uh, the tort claims limit is probably unconstitutional. We appealed because we thought that the, um, that the judge should have awarded damages against the, 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 city, the city for negligent hiring as well. Uh, the, the city filed their cross appeals uh, saying that, um, anyway, so that the state, court, the state court case is presently on appeal in the Court of Appeals in Santa Fe. The Court of Appeals in Santa Fe just two or three weeks ago finally decided they were going to grant permission to review the case. So that case, so th there will probably be arguments or something in that case sometime early this summer is my guess. Um, the federal court, the federal case was on hold. Judge Brack had entered a stay, just, just um, keeping everything at a standstill. Until the state court case was resolved, Judge Brack recently lifted that stay and, uh, and issued a couple of rulings which now allow that federal court case to proceed. And that's where we're at. Something you mentioned that's pretty appalling to me is the fact that uh, they have a limit on how much you can sue the city for for killing somebody. He was, the, and, and he was Shannon Bacon uh, awarded his family, Mr. Torres, uh, Six million bucks, but there's only there's a cap on how much they can award it, like four hundred thousand or something like that. So they have a, you know, they can uh, they can go around killing people and only have to pay out four hundred thousand dollars. And that's can, and that's one of the bases of our arguments on appeal is that seems to be a deprivation of due process. If if somebody else had killed my son, we could go after the whole six million, seven million, whatever we could get. But because a city official killed my son, supposedly we're limited now to less than half a million dollars. So anyway, again, those, those issues are, that issue is presently on appeal. I'd like to add a little bit to that too. Um, Shannon Bacon was also the, lawyer, the, 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 the judge that was uh, presiding in my son's case. And as you all may well know, was, uh, we won that case. There was a summary judgment. They didn't have to go to trial that Shannon Bacon made a summary judgment that my son's rights were violated. Uh, the officer violated my son's rights and killed my son, but yet the DA refuses to indict this officer to this day. But yet it's been proven in a court of law. We've had two judges. I had the current IRO at the time, independent review officer, um, retired Judge Deaton, and uh, he determined that my son's uh, rights were violated and the, sh and the shooting was unconstitutional. So we had two prominent judges determined that my son's shooting was unconstitutional, but yet we got a DA that refuses to indict. I mean, where's the justice in that? She is just as guilty as the man that pulled the trigger as far as I'm concerned. You have a job, you have a, you have a responsibility, you know, 
Do your job, lady. <clears throat> Thank you. As you can tell, we feel pretty passionate about this subject. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize. I'm still, uh, as, as you see with Steve, I'm still very upset. I hold it back a little better, but uh, at times it's I'm just like the water works slow. Cried a river of tears over this over the last five years. It's a pain that will never go away. There are a lot of measures in the consent decree that try to produce the conditions for accountability at APD. Do you think these policies were, will work to hold the police accountable? If not, what is it just the nature of these things to, to move really slowly or? I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, yeah, okay, let me repeat the question. Um, there are a lot of me measures in the consent decree that try to produce the condition for accountability at APD. Do you think these policies will work to hold the police accountable? If not, what what should we be doing that we currently aren't doing as a community or the government? Can I go first? Um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I don't know. I'll let you go. I, I just <laughs> I have so many thoughts on that that I'm trying to decide which one I want to use there. It's the only way anything is going to change is if the policies are enforced and the police officers are held accountable. And that lack of accountability has been severely lacking for the last 10, 15, maybe 20 or more years. There were standard operating procedures, SOPs, police department SOPs, that were in effect at the time Ken's son was shot and that were in effect at the time my son was shot. If the officers who went to my house three years ago had simply followed the established SOPs, my son would still be alive. But they violated at least three, maybe more, of their own SOPs in the way they handled and dealt with the situation with my son. And, and to this day, they've never been held accountable for violating those SOPs. The police chief hasn't held them accountable. The DA hasn't held them accountable. Nothing is going to change until these, these policies and procedures are enforced and these officers are held accountable. It's our position. That, um, that the excessive use of force that was um, the subject of the consent decree is something that was not just condoned and tolerated by the police department for the last 10, 15 years. It, it was actually encouraged. It was actually encouraged. And that's not just my opinion. Take a look at Judge Teresa Baca's ruling in the Andrew Lopez case. Judge Baca hit the nail on the head. She said the way these officers are being trained is designed to result in the unreasonable and necessary use of force. That was her ruling in that case. And yet that case is now over three, uh, almost three years old and we still see consistent ongoing problems. Now, I want to try and be fair to the police department because, as I've said all along, I'm, we're not anti-APD. We both have friends who serve on the police department. Good friends, friends I've known for many years. They're not all bad or rogue cops. Some of them are very good. Some of them have never once in their 20 years of service ever had to draw their weapons. Those are the good cops and we applaud them for doing their job. But there are officers out there who are being trained to use unnecessary force whenever they want. And they do it because they know they're not going to be held accountable. The police chief is not going to discipline them, not going to, not going to call them on the carpet. The, 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 um, the independent review officer is, is hamstrung, has no enforcement powers. The uh, police oversight committee, at least the old one, 
had no powers to do anything. This new one has given us some evidence that maybe they're going to take a harder stance, and we hope they do. But unless and until these officers are held accountable, they're going to keep doing this. We have seen some glimpses of hope. Because of what's happened, because of the uh, consent decree, we have seen, you remember the situation with the young man on the freeway who was threatening to jump? If, if that situation had happened two years ago, I don't think the police would have had any hesitation to shoot him. You don't want to follow our instructions, boom, you're done with. The, um, so we, we have seen some glimpses of hope. The other man who was barricaded here, oh, about three, four months ago, and the SWAT team was called out, and after all night, 12 hours or so, they did manage to get him to give up. If that situation, that same situation, if those same set of facts had happened two years ago, he'd be dead. I have no doubt about that. So we have seen some glimmers of hope that maybe the police department is learning, maybe they are um, reconsidering their tactics. But then again, as soon as we think we're making progress, then we see then we see situations that happen, like the young, like the lady that was just. Uh, dragged out of her car in her driveway, what, about three, four weeks ago? Uh, for, because she had an expired registration tag? Good grief. So anyway, there, there's, we, 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 sometimes we think we're making progress, and then, it turn, and then we take another look at the situation, and there's still a lot more work to do. So I'll add to that some, to some. Um, so the bottom line and what, what we figured out and what we found out through all this process is that the system is broken. We have a lot of checks and balances to keep these officers in, in, in line and uh, none of them work. Um, this problem that we have with APD has got a history that goes back a long time. This police department has been brutalizing this community for years and getting away with killing people in this community for years. Um, they, it was, uh, what was it, uh, the early 80s that they uh, initiated this uh, police oversight commission. Um, they have a grand jury process. I mean, all these checks and balances have been proven to, to do nothing but exonerate the officers and, um, you know, fleece the public and, 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 uh, and believing that there's accountability. Um, the grand jury system had been shut down via my son's case um, because they would orchestrate this cover-up and they would rehearse everything with this officer and they would go in and present this story to the grand jury that was nothing more than a fabrication of, uh, of, of, the, of the events in order to exonerate the officers. So, and then they would seal it. They would seal the, the, the transcripts from the grand jury so you wouldn't be able to know what took place. And they did all this. Um, the way they do that, they have this process that's so encumbersome it's hard to follow. Mike Gomez figured it out. It took him quite a while to do it, but they, this process that they use to justify these officers is, uh, is, a, is a systemic uh, breakdown in, in, in the judicial system. And so um, the police department has not only victimized the community as far as the individuals, but they victimized the judicial system. They victimized the judges, they victimized the prosecutors by presenting these lies, and then these judges and prosecutors have to back these lies up as facts. And so... Let, um, me, let, me, let me add to that, because that's an important point. It, excuse me for interrupting. No, go ahead, please. If I commit a crime, a serious crime, my case will probably be presented to the grand jury, and a, and a jury of my peers will decide if there's sufficient evidence to warrant the DA's office going forward with prosecuting me. That's the, way it, that's the way it's supposed to happen for all of us. If a police officer did something wrong up until about a year ago, his case didn't go to the regular grand jury, it went to a special grand jury. DA Kerry Brandenburg had set up this special grand jury proceeding reserved solely for police officers. And, the, and the, the job of this special grand jury was not to decide whether or not there was enough evidence to warrant going forward with the case, as would have happened with me or you. The job of this special grand jury was solely to determine whether or not the police officer's action was justified. And of course, if they're only hearing the police officer's version of the story after it's been rehearsed, 
of course they're going to find that it's justified. So that's why there was never any officers uh, indicted. And as, as Ken said, this was something that was kept secret. Not even the judges knew about it. When they found out about it, uh, Chief Judge Ted Bach at the time called in the district attorney and said, what's going on here? What are you doing? And after he found out what she was doing, he said, this has got to stop. And he put an immediate stop to that special grand jury proceeding. I have friends who are assistant DAs who work for the district attorney's office. They told me they didn't know there was a special grand jury proceeding going on for police officers. It was a complete secret and designed just to, just to give favorable treatment to police officers. To exonerate the officer, designed to exonerate the officer and to, um, uh, you know, basically uh, the problem with that also was that the, uh, the, there was no rebuttal, there was no defense, there was no, nothing to, to present to the grand jury from, from the victim side or the family side, so, you know, it's, uh, and that's just one aspect of the system. So they designed this system with the Police Oversight Commission and the, you know, uh, independent review officer. The whole uh, accountability mechanism is, was nothing more than a, a farce. You know, it was, it was a lie. It was, a, it was designed to give the public false perception of accountability. And uh, that's exactly what it did. So, um, you know, what we really need accountability and that's hopefully we'll get accountability with the James Boyd killers we'll see but I do see the dynamics starting to change and, 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 and hopefully we have enough good people on it and uh, people with uh, you know morals and stuff that we can get it done right um, it's just gonna be a long road to hope we got a long way to go it's hard to hard to untrain something once you've learned something it's hard to unlearn it so um, we really need to retrain our officers and, and be real uh, careful of who we give a gun to and give the authority to go out and use deadly force. You can't. We have a lot of uh, officers that shouldn't be officers, quite frankly. They are, uh, um, some of them are on steroids. That was proved here in this city uh, with the roid rage, and they have a lot of, uh, you know, they have a lot of uh, psychological issues themselves, and so. As a community, we really need to uh, be real careful on who we uh, put out in our in our community with our families. I can't prove it. I'll never be able to prove it. If it happened, I'm sure they've gotten rid of all the evidence. But I invite you, go back and do a Google search of the circumstance of, of when my son's case went to trial, and you should be able to find a picture of Detective. Christopher Brown, take a look at him. Tell me if you don't think he was on steroids. I, I, just, I just throw that out to you. You think, you think Sammy Sosa looked like it? <laughs> anyway. Right. I'd like to get um, some more insight on your guys' perspective about what, what, what do you guys see, like, the culture of the APD force and like what are the problems uh, that you guys see in the culture between the officers that I don't know, make them seem so aggressive? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. What, uh, what makes them aggressive? It's the training. It's the way they, you know, it's, uh, first of all, they want ex-military. So you got military individuals that are, have been in war and have been, you know, in combat and have seen and have, done things that, you know, and so now we have a soldier that's now wearing a blue uniform, and now we have a soldier that's out there uh, in, in, the, in our community, and, and the only thing he knows how to do is kill. He don't know how to negotiate. He don't know how to do anything but use his, use his weapon. So um, we really got to have, uh, you know, I can't say it enough, accountability, and that goes all the way up to the president, as far as I'm concerned, we have, uh, you know, we have a, a big problem in this country, and uh, and it's 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 embarrassing. It's embarrassing to be an American, knowing that, you know, the rest of the world sees how our police department treats us. That's that's, uh, 
you know, no wonder, you know, people have a, a you know a negative conversation on Americans. It's not the Americans; it's the leadership of the Americans that's that's, that's caused the, the black eye. Um, Professor Correa told me that, that that the students had been assigned to read the New Yorker article and the um, Rolling Stone article. After those articles came out, I got a phone call from retired police chief Jerry Galvin. Chief Galvin was the police chief back during the Jim Baca administration 15 years ago. Chief Galvin called me to apologize. He said, he said, I'm sorry, I wanted to apologize because he said when Jim Baca hired me to be police chief, he gave me two jobs. Number one, increase the crisis intervention training for the police officers. And number two, reverse the warrior mentality that had invaded the police department. Those were his marching orders 15 years ago. And we've, we've done the research. We, I mean, we, we've done a lot. We've, we've done a heck of a lot of research. Chief Galvin was making progress during his administration. Unfortunately, as soon as he left, this, the situation just went, kept going and started to escalate even worse than it was before. But that was, that was his job identified by Mayor Jim Baca 15 years ago. We need to do something about this warrior mentality in our police department. So again, this, this, this is not a new problem. This is a problem that's been going on for 20, 30 years or more. Take a look at the Walker Luna report. The Walker Luna report that was commissioned back in the 96 identified the same problems. It's, it's anyway. Steve. Uh, did we answer your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. you guys did great. Um, Steve, the New Yorker article painted a disturbing picture of not just APD, but also the reaction of city leaders to both of you after the officers killed Christopher. It seems that you were either ignored when you reached out or you were targeted for intimidation. There's so much to talk about pol police accountability, but this struck as a lack of, pers of personal accountability by the city leaders, such as the mayor and in particular, former police chief Ray Schultz. Could you describe the pattern of intimidation and disregard you experienced that followed your son's killing? And should we consider this disregard for your grief as part of the same problem at APD? The answer is I really don't know. We'll, we'll never really know. Um, as mentioned, I think it was in the New York article, as, as I think, believe it was mentioned, I used to think Chief Ray Schultz was my friend. Not a good friend, I mean, we didn't hang out together and stuff like that, but I knew Ray 30 years ago. Our kids used to play soccer on the same local soccer team out, out there in Taylor Ranch. So I knew Ray, I knew who he was, I, I thought he was one of the good cops. Um, so naively, after this situation happened with my son, I, I reached out to Ray, I sent a letter to Ray and to the mayor shortly after Christopher's death, I think within two weeks of Christopher's death, inviting them. Let's get together. Let's get together. Let's take a look at this situation. Let's try and figure out what's going on here and what we can do to try and correct the situation. I never got an answer from Ray. I never got an answer from, from the mayor until over two years later. Over two years later, the mayor finally, at that one meeting we went to, the mayor finally did convey his condolences. He said, he did tell me, he, he told us, you know, that he wanted to convey his condolences and... I don't think that was sincere. I think oh, that yeah. was forced. That's I, a personal opinion. I don't know if it was sincere or not, but he did give it. He did give his condolences. I'm thinking that they're both just following the advice of their attorneys. Their attorneys have told them, do not talk to them, certainly do not apologize. Um, Ray Schultz admitted in the one of the two, either Rolling Stone or 
or a New Yorker, he admitted that he knew that I had reached out to him and that I was waiting for an answer from him. I mean, he acknowledged that, but I've never heard anything from, from them. As I said, the mayor finally did meet with us and expressed his condolences. And even during that meeting, once again, we told the mayor, let us help you. Let's figure out a way, whether we put a forum together or a study group or whatever, the mayor, the mayor recognized that there was a significant problem in the police department, and we told him. We said, let us help you. We've never been invited to sit down and help in any way. So I'll add to that. Um, so the question was uh, targeted for intimidation. Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. They came after me to shut me up because I was in their face big time. They wanted to marry Han me. I don't know if you all knew who that is, but uh, she was murdered by this police department. And that, those facts will come out eventually. Um, but yeah, absolutely intimidation. Um, cell phones were acting crazy, computers acting crazy, stuff going on, couldn't leave the house. I don't care if you went this way or that way, there's a cop at either end of the street. This went on for several months after my son was killed. They literally, you know, used their stingray. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but that's an advice that the police can use to tap your phone anytime, anyplace, anywhere. Um, they literally uh, confronted me on four different occasions. Um, it was just by the grace of God and by uh, divine intervention that they didn't, uh, you know, take me out because uh, that's what they do when someone gets in their face. They eliminate the problem. Um, so, uh, and then second part of that question, uh, ignored by the administration. Yes, I don't know how many times that we went to city council and they were like, you know, rolling their eyes and playing with their computer. They wouldn't listen. I mean, they were, they were hearing us, but they weren't listening or listening and not hearing or something. I don't know what their deal was, but uh, yeah, we were ignored. And, and, and finally, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing what this administration did to try to uh, divert DOJ from coming here. They... Uh, literally threw a couple officers under the bus. They literally, uh, uh, you know, uh, broke some more laws to try to keep DOJ from coming here. But, uh, and then uh, disregard for grief and, and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. They, I never heard nothing out of the mayor until, until he was forced to sit down with us at a, at a meeting uh, through uh, one of the organizations that helped uh, get DOJ here. So, yeah, there's... Uh, um, you know, we felt vindicated when DOJ came out with their Skaven report. That that gave us, you know, it, it vindicated what we were saying. And, and, and so now we weren't just the crazy, grieving parents anymore. Now we actually had a little bit of, uh, you know, clout to what we were saying. And so, yeah, total disregard for our feelings, our family's feelings. Um, you know, intimidated, absolutely, without a doubt. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I had forgotten that second part of the question. Um, likewise, just to give you a couple more examples, we, I mean, we had officers parked at the end of our street also. Um, we had an eight, my, 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 my middle son, Daniel, lives in Rio Rancho. Rio Rancho, that's not even Albuquerque. There was an APD squad car parked down the street from his house for a while. Why? We don't know. A couple of curious things that did happen. My, my neighbor across the street, he's one of these high-tech, high-tech, geeky kind of guys. He's got a high-tech security system in his house. We don't have anything like that at our house. But he's got one at his house. And he came to me one day and he said, what's, what's this all this about? And I said, what are you talking about? Apparently on the recordings that go through his security system, there was something about surveillance van. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it sure is curious. Also, just to let you know, I've got a, I've got a 97 Ford pickup truck. It's been a very good truck for me for 10 years. Curiously enough, about two years ago, one of the, the, the lug nuts on the right one front wheel came loose. And the tire just comes off the vehicle. Fortunately, I wasn't going very fast. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I just didn't tighten it very well last time I changed it. A couple of months later, the same thing happened all over again. 
Can I prove that it, that was APD or somebody? I, I can't prove it. It's just very curious. It's just very curious. Wow. Well, that was some shocking stuff. Well, we're going to share the rest of the time with um, the audience for and open it up to a Q&A. Go ahead, hon. Okay. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a graduate student in the planning department, and I'm from Oakland, California, so I'm pretty familiar with the issues of police, the police of power. Um, I have three questions. So the city is hosting, or Mayor Barry's office is hosting um, this collaborative dialogue series in which they've identified stakeholders, those stakeholders supposedly show up to these meetings, and then um, community members, <coughs> And APD show up and they have these conversations and ways in which to improve relations between police and community members. And I'm just, I've attended every meeting and I'm just wondering, um, there's actually more attendance here than there have been at these meetings. And I'm wondering um, whether y'all are aware of these meetings and if you've considered attending them. Um, my next question is also, when we talk about reforming law enforcement, um, I mean, we keep talking about all these major systems that are not serving our needs. And so I'm wondering whether actually law enforcement can be reformed if what law, law enforcement's purpose is to um, enforce the status quo. So I think this conversation, although we're talking about it in New Mexico, as if it's, you know, it's got this history of 30 years, but we have a longer history of colonization and um, I think what the only component that's really changed is who's on the receiving end of police brutality. Uh, you know, that maybe in initially it was people of color, uh, indigenous people, now it's moving to um, folks who are in, you know, crisis <coughs> or poor people. Um, so I just want to know if you guys actually believe that these systems can be reformed. And I think a real key um, aspect of this conversation is accountability, as you guys spoke to. Coming from Oakland, I have an uncle who was, two uncles that were Oakland police officers, one that was forcibly retired for his involvement with um, a group of corrupt police officers called the Oakland Riders. You can Google it, it's great. Um, my uncle was forcibly retired because of his involvement. We're not really sure how involved he was. These officers uh, were involved in you know, planting evidence, raping prostitutes, uh, coercing, all this great stuff. And so, but what ended up happening is my uncle benefited from the pension and then was rehired um, on a separate contractor status payroll. So even when we talk about these officers getting, you know, indicted or, you know, they're, maybe they're losing their jobs and they're being shifted around from the departments, you know, there's these other guys that we don't know about because they're on a separate payroll. So I'm just curious, and I guess that accountability really we is attached to the um, whether the system can be reformed. So I'm just curious what you guys think about all that. So I'll, uh, the first part of the question was about the collaborative meetings, and yes, I uh, we we went to we went to a, a few of the first ones and, and quickly realized that it was nothing more than smoking mirrors. Um, so those collaborative meetings, there's no participation because it's it's uh, a waste of your time. Um, you know, it's uh, th those meetings are I feel like are are nothing more than uh, damage control type stuff. Um, and then uh, you know, can 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 the uh, can there be reform? Absolutely, um, but not under the current system. We're gonna have to change some laws. We're gonna have to make it so that the uh, that there is accountability and you know it's it's very disturbing to me that an officer can violate someone's rights break the law get fired and then go to work next door at the next police station how does that work that that doesn't make any sense um you know so there's uh, officers have to be certified they have to they have a certificate that says that they're an officer that certificate can be removed um there is a, a an officer review board um, another supposed to be accountability system it ain't working the system is not working so um, in order to get an officer that uh, 
off the police force and keep him from going to another police force, you have to remove his certification, and that uh, seems to be pretty near impossible at this point. I'm not quite as cynical as my good friend Ken. <laughs> I'm, I'm a realist. I'm, I'm holding out hope. I've been to some of these meetings. I, I went to the Behavioral Health Collaborative meeting. I'm still regularly attending APD Forward meetings. I was a participant on the amicus uh, submissions that went in front of the federal court a few weeks ago. So I'm, I'm still trying to work within these groups and these, um, and these bodies to try and effectuate some change. But it does get frustrating. It does get frustrating. Uh, as far as whether or not the system can be fixed, I don't know. I told you I've got several good friends who are police officers or formal, former police officers. I met with one of them, good friend of mine, Gilbert Nahada, Lieutenant Gilbert Nahada. Gil used to be in charge of training at the APD Academy. He's now teaching criminal justice down at Western New Mexico University. But I met with Gilbert because he had some ideas. You know what his suggestion is? Get rid of APD altogether. It is so broken you can't fix it. It is so broken it cannot be fixed. His suggestion is get rid of APD altogether, let the Sheriff's Department take over law enforcement in Bernalillo County and Albuquerque, but there's no fixing APD in his opinion. So I, 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 I hope that it can be fixed. I guess it remains to be seen whether it will be fixed. I think a lot's going to depend on this, on this federal monitor that's recently been appointed. Let's, let's see what kind of a job he's going to do. Let's see how effective the judge is going to do, is going to be in, in enforcing the change that needs to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, of course, my wife accuses me of being much too naive, but I'm, I'm not quite as cynical as my good friend Ken. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can fix the problem. We'll see. D did we answer your question? I hope yeah, so. I all of you. I, I know it takes time out of your, your leisure time and time away from your families, but get out and attend some of these meetings. Get out and attend some of them. I, I'm, I'm glad to see we've got such a good turnout here today.
I have been afraid of APD in the past. I'm afraid of APD now. And if they continue to pacify through their cells and their doctrines the damage control <coughs> avenues that you're expressing, Mr. Ellis, this problem is not going to resolve itself. I hope <coughs> that my attendance at the police academy will continue to adhere to the voice of our concern because I keep asking hard questions, which comes to this. In your investigative processes, and I've asked this of the mayor's office, the city's attorney's office, the APD, I have asked this of the new board in public, where is there a complete written copy from beginning to end that somebody can view without having to go to the computer, which is totally asinine, of all of the standard operating procedures that policemen have to follow, including the tactical. And every time I ask that question, it's in the computer. I would like to see a written copy available for those people that don't have computers that can look at that and say, wait a minute, you say this here, but this happens. Could you reflect on that for us, gentlemen? Go ahead. When we, when we wanted to look and see what the standard operating procedures were, that's where we had to go. We had to go to the city's computer website and, and navigate it. But it, it is there. Um, I don't have a copy, otherwise I'd, I'd make one for you. Um, if, you if you're interested, I, you can probably contact our attorneys. They've got a copy. It certainly it was part of what, we were, of what was introduced in evidence at, our, at my son's trial. Um, McGinn Carpenter Law Firm, 8... Eight four three six one six one. I'm don't don't quote. Uh, I'm sorry. McGinn Carpenter Law Firm. If you call them, they they should be able to get you a a hard what's paper. Yeah, a, a a hard copy of those of those of those policies. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope that helps. The problem with you, that. Con contact your city councilor. He should be able to get that for you. <laughs> The problem with that is that you can have an encyclopedia full of SOPs if you don't follow them, what good are they? Yeah. So that's where we are. They're not following the rules they're sworn to uphold. Questions? Again, Mr. Jones, uh, my name is Christopher Steele, retired Navy. My one question I have is, uh, in the, it's the related police brutality, is there going to be Brandenburg wants to prosecute the case against James Boyd? In your opinion, do you think she should be the one that does it, or should we get another attorney or DA to do the prosecuting against James Boyd? I just want to know what's your opinion. Well, personally, my opinion is, yes, we ought to get somebody in here that's not uh, part of the problem. We ought to get an independent prosecutor, independent DA. We ought to take it out of state actually um. I, I agree ideally ideally any time a police officer is charged with a criminal offense you probably need an independent prosecutor because the present DA is just so intrinsically tied in with the police department I think it's impossible to get an objective um, prosecutor the problem is You'd, you'd probably have to change the law, and then how are we going to pay for it? Those are the two problems there. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I ask a question about the cell cameras and their lack of use, or is that supposed to be sort of an accountability thing? That I just was curious about this. Well, here we go again with <laughs> SOPs <laughs> and rules. Yes, you, you know, and, and the problem is, is that there's no accountability. You know, um, Jeremy uh, Deer, Deer killed Mary Hawk, 19-year-old young lady. Um, turned his lapel camera off, killed the lady, turned it back on. Um, so yeah, accountability, accountability, accountability. Bottom line, 
you don't turn that camera on, hit the road. Give me your certification. There, there, there is an SOP, an established SOP in effect. It's been in effect for years that any time you have a, an encounter with a citizen, you're supposed to turn on your camera and your audio, whatever recorder is. We've all, we've all heard the excuses. I, oh, I forgot to turn it on. I turned it on, but it malfunctioned. Uh, Officer Deer's excuse was that as he was chasing Miss Hawk, the, his cord must have gotten snagged on something and it unplugged it. I mean, but yeah, the, the policy's there. It's not being enforced. That's the problem. Police can't police police. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I do. Um, so I started uh, my court case against an APD officer um, two years ago in 2013, um, and he uh, used unnecessary force in my arrest. Um, and so it was a two-year fight. Um, I had to fight eight different charges that he wrapped up on me, um, two assault, uh, two accounts on assault on account of a police officer, and one battery on a police officer, and one. Um, aggravated assault. So um, so all these different charges were added as a fear tactic. Um, and I don't know how many people have that done to them, but I mean, I'm 120 pounds. Um, he used 200, like he used force for like a 200 pound man um, in every single movement that he did in my arrest. And on the lapel camera, you can see me being very cordial, very, you know, um, very respectful of the officer. Um, I wasn't drunk. I was accused of being drunk over and over again um, on the lapel camera. You can see him escalating on his own. Um, but I refused the breathalyzer test because I was chewing gum. Um, I did have a drink. Um, I had one drink um, and then like a sip of a whiskey. But that whiskey smell was what I was afraid of. And then also the alcohol and the gum. And so I, I knew that I had, the uh, I had the right to refuse the breathalyzer. The first portable breathalyzer, you can refuse that. And I knew that, and so I refused that. Um, and he escalated, and he used an arm bar, and without even forewarning me, without telling me that I was under arrest, he put his hands on me, and I pulled away, and that second that I pulled away, he said, stop resisting, ma'am, and yanked up my arm, and it hurt my shoulder, so I pulled away, and immediately, stop resisting, stop resisting, and then all this force, he kicked me in my lower abdomen, my lower back, um, he put his, he arm barred my neck, and so my esophagus was crushed. And you can't see any of this. Like, you can see us scuffling, but there's no video, visual proof it's too dark. of it. It's too dark, exactly. So we lighten the footage, but you still can't see his foot kick me. He kicked me in the front, right? And so I, like, maybe crashed into the car. Um, and you can hear my esophagus get crushed. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I, I filed a, a lawsuit, and I, I didn't go all the way. We started with a settlement. Um, of $90,000, and that's what I should have gotten. I should have gotten that for all the aggravated assault that he did on me and the unnecessary force that he used on me. Um, there is a point there, and I, I want to get to that. Um, but the, the fact is, is that there's, the settlement is, is where they, they have that agreement to put it, in the, put it in the past or whatever and just drop all charges against the officer I wanted to take it all the way, but there was a criminal defense attorney that was playing devil's advocate um, on our side, and he was saying that he, if he were the, the criminal defense attorney and he was protecting the APD officer, we had no fighting case because we had no visual evidence. So it was all, like you can hear me crushed, like you can hear my esophagus getting crushed and me screaming, but you can't see anything. So I had a fighting loss, uh, or a, a, a loss in the fight. So I didn't have a fighting chance. Um, so I took the settlement. I got seventeen five hundred, um, but the the lawyer took half of that, right? So I only walked away with nine thousand. Um, do you know of any other case, or do you know the statistics of people who don't have such a huge um, court case, like sh shootings, or like people who have just been aggressively beaten up, or 
you know, do you have that statistics? Well, I have a, a case going. Do you keep fighting them, keep it all the way, just push all the way, and they will end up dropping the charges. I mean, they have to. Like, once you fight all the way, well, it just see, takes I a long time. And a I already got a case from the courts stating their charges can be brought up in federal court. Right. But it's been yeah, it is, and they will scare you. Oh, they're doing that right now. So, so much, yeah. yeah I, had, I got PTSD from it. So let me add a couple of things to your story that, uh, that come to light here that, that, I, that I know for a fact, and that is that the city hires law firms to defend them. So that law firm is beholden to the city. Now you go to that law firm and you want to sue the city. Well, that law firm's going to heme haw around and they're going to play games with you and they're going to drag this on and they're going to da 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 until you fire the law firm or give up or whatever. So um, we have a we have a real problem with the, the the law firms that work for the city and then and and then so we also have uh, the city actually budgets for lawsuits. They budget ten million dollars a year for lawsuits against APD. A majority, I would venture to say. I don't know specific statistics, but uh, in my uh, endeavors and over the over the course of the last four and a half, five years, I uh, spoke to literally thousands of people on the streets, and and uh, you know they, you're one of tens of thousands, and you're lucky they didn't kill you. Um, they do what they did to you on an hourly basis in this city. That's the way they police. They police with brutality. I, I don't know of any statistics or records that are being kept on situations like yours. We do know that there is a lot of anecdotal uh, records. Um, DOJ got a lot of that when they held their, their, their meetings and they were asking the public to come in and give stories on, what, on their encounters with the police department. So they, they, they did get a lot of that. Um, from what we've learned, we, our police department is notorious and seems somehow to pick on the homeless. The homeless are having a heck of a time here in Albuquerque dealing with the police department right now. Native Americans are being targeted by the police. Mentally ill um, citizens are having a heck of a time with the police department. And ma'am, I don't want to sound unsympathetic, and I don't want, and I don't hope I don't sar sound sarcastic. But as Ken said, I'm glad you're not dead. That possibility is very real. Anytime you have any contact with APD, sir. Uh, my name is Max Madras, and I, I uh, received a brain injury in uh, August of uh, 2009. Wow, uh, my, my road has been rough. I've, this is my first meeting here. I came to get some enlightenment. Uh, I thought I was going crazy, everything else. I had two attorneys quit on me. I finally got a good attorney, so I can't talk too, too much about the case. But I did receive a brain injury by a blow in the head. Uh, my house was the wrong address when I first uh, just like this young lady here, the lapel was too dark. All they could hear is scuffling and, and me screaming for cops to come and save me, basically. Um, uh, but there was a, it, it kept going beyond nothing, you know. And so there was a lot of important things that, that I remember that was not on the lapel. Uh, so hopefully that will, will come out. Um, and, uh, but now, like you said, uh, sir, um, I'm going through this stingray test of them targeting my phone, computer, things going haywire. My, uh, in fact, just uh, last Saturday at Rio 24, my granddaughter uh, and my grandson, which is only six months old, was going to a movie at APD, the uh, movie theater called APD, 
for some strange reason, and APD pulled guns out on my daughter and grandson at six months old and told him he couldn't be in the movies. I mean, I mean, it was ridiculous. And so they gave her nine free passes. <laughs> you know? okay. I mean, We're going to have to wrap this up. What's your question, sir? Uh, my qu 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 question is, I just want to, I'm just, I'm here to support all the people here. And I'm going to try to enlighten myself and learn more to, uh, so I can be supportive to this community. Well, that's what it's going to take. Bottom line is, is it's going to take involvement. It's going to take each and every one of us to do our part in order to make this right. We've got to change some laws, and we've got to have some accountability in our leadership. Um, you know, that's, that's the bottom line, and we've got to get money out of politics. So uh, we've got, we got, we got, we got a lot of uh, lot to do. So, Well, everyone, um, that's about all the time we have for this lecture. Um, Stephen, Ken, thank you. I admire your courage. Thank you. Have a bad day. Thank you. Keep up the good work.